colleagues. Good afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome to the Faculty of Social Sciences Plagiarism and Citation Management Seminar. This seminar is the first part um, in a series for graduate students, and the faculty is hosting several of these events. So you are having the opportunity to participate in part one of this series. And we're really happy that so many of you were able to, to join us today. My name is Tracy McFarlane, and I am a senior lecturer in the Department of Sociology, Psychology, and Social Work. And I have the pleasure of being your moderator for today. Our presenters are from the UE Mona Main Library. And we have with us today, Ms. Audrey Sadler and Mrs. Carleen Nelson. And they are going to provide us with a wealth of information that we need for citing our sources properly and avoiding the dreaded big P, right? Plagiarism. And you know that this is very important for all of us in this academic enterprise. And so all of us can benefit from these very valuable tips that they'll be presenting to you. So the way we're going to proceed is that I will introduce the first speaker and she will give her presentation. Then I will introduce a second and then we'll have time for Q&A up to 3 p.m. So our first speaker is Mrs. Audrey Sadler, and she is currently employed as a librarian to the UE Mona Library. Her primary areas of responsibility focus on software applications used by the library to manage its core operations and access to a suite of electronic resources. Ms. Sadler also functions as liaison librarian with responsibility for UE Scholar at the Mona campus. And I have benefited from one of those sessions on UE, UE Scholar. I still need to make it a little more presentable up to the standard, Ms. Sadler, but you gave us a great start. Ms. Sadler also um, serves as a liaison librarian to the various stakeholders um, within the university community. And we're happy that this includes our own faculty of social sciences, for example, providing support when we meet for faculty board. As an adjunct lecturer at the Department of Library and Information Studies, Mona, Ms. Sadler has been engaged at the graduate level since 2013. So she's no stranger to this um, space. So we now welcome Ms. Sadler to give her presentation on avoiding plagiarism. Welcome, Ms. Sadler. Okay, so Ms. Sadler, um, please remember to unmute. I just realized. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for that introduction. And this is um, a brief presentation because we really would not be able to cover all the different nuances um, of plagiarism within the time frame. The library is very happy to have been invited by the faculty to speak on the, the topic of plagiarism and to do a brief demonstration on EndNote because we understand the importance of, of, of plagiarism um in the environment so during the session there are some just some brief things that we will highlight so i'm getting my finger going so it really is just to identify and discuss the concept of of plagiarism the types of plagiarism the penalties and to recognize the importance of different citations to citation tools and to look at endnote which is available through the ue mona library so as we look at this word, word cloud, we see that plagiarism really jumps out at you. And some of the terms that are highlighted are theft, cheating, fraud, stealing. 
the whole matter of integrity, ethics, etc. And when we look at plagiarism, those are some of the, the, the ideas and the concepts that are going to come to the fore, because in a nutshell, what we're looking at is a use of someone else's work without giving proper credit. And so in a sense, what we're saying is that these ideas are ours and they are original thoughts when in truth and in fact, they're not so. I like this definition from the Encyclopedia of Social Problems, and it tells us basically that what plagiarism is, is to represent um, as to represent yourself as the author of some work which in fact belongs to somebody else. And it could be anything. So it could be writing, it could be a piece of artwork. It could be a clip from a video. It could be anything. And they point out that plagiarism exists as a serious problem within the walls of Western academia. They also go on to note that with the advent of the World Wide Web and vast electronic databases, the challenge has multiplied. And what has now happened is that new methods of plagiarism, some persons that say we're now in the era of copy and paste, have arisen, but new detection tools have also um, been developed. And these are now in play as there is an increased sense of awareness, not only among students, but also among scholars. And as we will see in a little while, it is also a matter that is of concern where publishers are concerned. The University of the West Indies is no different from any other university. And so there is a policy in place which speaks to the whole matter of plagiarism. And when you look at the UA policy, it basically states that it is someone else's work that is being that is not your own that you are attempting to pass off as your own. And it includes materials from books, journals, or any other printed source, the work of other students, staff, information from the internet, software programs, et cetera. And it also looks at how the information is organized or structured. Sometimes our students, I find, don't even realize that their class notes, their the PowerPoints, um, that are presented, if you're going to use them in your work, you need to cite them and to present the citation in a particular way, depending on the citation tool that um, you are using and depending on not citation tool, the citation style, sorry, that you're using. And so the UA has policies and these policies are found in the undergraduate coursework accountability statement, as well as a graduate coursework accountability statement. Now, um, it is something that we, we, we don't often give the, 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 the level of seriousness that should be given. But when we look at the literature and when we look at what obtains, you will find, for example, um, in Australia, where a provost was actually removed from the position because it was proven that he had plagiarized about 20 years prior to him having become provost. And um, when you look at the literature as well, you will see where students have lost their scholarships. Um, they have lost research grants. They have lost their positions at universities because they were deemed to have plagiarized. And so it, it is a very um, challenging situation in which academia has found itself. And the measures are in place to deal with this. Now there are different types of plagiarism. 
And so when we look at plagiarism, we are looking at the possibility where you take another person's work and you pass it off on as your own without changing anything or identifying where it came from. And so we know that once we use a direct quotation, we are to use quotation marks. We are, so, we are also expected to indicate the name of the author and we are expected to provide a page number from which the quotation was, was, was pulled. We also know that depending on whether you have a short quotation or a long quotation, there are different ways in which to present it. And so um, long quotations, they require being placed in a block. So which is to indent um, half inch in and it stands on its own, but you would still need to indicate the page number as well as the author and the year from which the information was taken. We also look at paraphrasing and paraphrasing occurs when you change the words of your sources without giving due credit. There's mosaic plagiarism, which is, which is a partial paraphrasing of the content. And so your paper therefore becomes a mix of your work and your sources. Now, all of us have different writing styles. And so as you read someone's paper, just by reading a paragraph or a page, you can often tell the differences between the different writing styles. And so you will know, hey, these thoughts did not necessarily come from Audrey Sadler, they came from someone else. Now we have what is also called self-plagiarism. And self-plagiarism occurs when you use previous work and you are sub submitting it either in the same assignment or you are submitting it in a paper that you're publishing without indicating that this was previous work. And so in essence, what you are doing is recycling. And this is something that the publishers, when you look at publishers, publishers will speak about self-plagiarism, about recycling your work. There is accidental plagiarism, um, presenting information from your sources, but you forget to include the citation. And some persons actually misquote the sources. So they, they did pay close attention to the page from which a quotation was taken. And so it was taken from page five and they have indicated in their in-text citation, page four or page six, both of which are incorrect because it would have been taken from page five. And then we have what is called misattribution when someone, when information is taken from one source and is credited to another. And these are just some of the different types of plagiarism that you will come across. Now, just as academia is concerned with plagiarism, publishers are also concerned and so if you look at the um, editorial statements of a lot of the publishers, what they speak to are the ethical um, considerations, the ethical guidelines, the whole matter of integrity, which publishers need to follow when they are publishing. And in the interest of time, I had, um, just wanted to highlight some of these. And so I was doing some search and I looked at the National Library of Medicine and what the National Library of Medicine did was an extensive um, article on what is plagiarism and how to avoid it. Uh, my finger tends to go a little fast. So they have given us a definition of plagiarism right? But what I want to draw your attention to is the Committee of Publication Ethics, COPE, and all of the publishers will look to COPE on the definition of plagiarism and basically how to deal with plagiarism. And so from COPE's perspective, plagiarism really 
ranges from the unreferenced use of other persons published and unpublished ideas, including research grant applications to submissions on the new authorship of a complex paper, sometimes in a different language. And it may occur at any stage of planning, research, writing or publications, and it applies to print and electronic versions. And I would encourage you in your own time to look at some of, 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 of what um, this article presents. It speaks to some of what I highlighted, mosaic plagiarism, um, paraphrasing, they have verbatim, and then they also speak about the whole notion of, of self-plagiarism. And so these are some of the things that we have to bear in mind. And they're now also talking about cyber plagiarism, which is copying or downloading in part or in their entirety, articles or research papers and ideas from the internet and not giving proper attribution. And that is unethical and it falls in the range of cyber plagiarism. We're also in the age of paper mills where you have persons who are paid a fee to write papers for students or somebody who is doing some research to publish. And that also rears its head because the same person could be writing multiple papers on the same topic for different persons. And what you find is that will speak to the whole matter of ethics and the matter of integrity. And so some of those that I looked at were um, Taylor and Francis, Emerald, Springer, and Elsevier. And all of them speaks to plagiarism and how they handle it. So once your paper has been reviewed and it has been deemed to, to, to have crossed that um, era of plagiarism, they will advise you. And based on whether you make the necessary changes or not, in some instances, they are duty bound to advise your university that you have plagiarized. And it may not happen often, but in some instances, they may advise other publishers depending on the nature of, 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 of your infraction. And so um, these are some of the publishers who you can look at to see exactly what is happening. Now there are some tips and I took this one from plagiarism.org and their first recommendation is to understand what is expected of you. And understanding what is expected of you, it is critical that you understand the citation style that you are to use. So is it Chicago? Is it MLA? Um, is it APA? Is it Harvard, etc.? Because each citation style will have their own nuances. So you need to understand what the expect expectations are. And then you need to ensure that you have collected credible sources because these sources are going to be the building block for your discussion, for your paper, for your research. And if your building block is faulty, then you are going to have challenges. You're also encouraged to make notes, to plan and structure your presentation effectively. And when in doubt, you are to cite. Now, I found a infographics from the Office of research integrity, which I found to be quite interesting. And what they're also looking at is tips for avoiding plagiarism. And so they have defined plagiarism as the appropriation of another person's ideas, processes, results, or words without giving um, appropriate credit. And they have said, number one, 
always acknowledge the contribution of others in your work, identify the citation store, source when paraphrasing or summarizing, provide a citation when in doubt about facts or common knowledge, always en enclose verbatim text in quotation marks with an accompanying, accompanying citation and cite primary sources of information, not secondary sources. And this I took from the Office of Research Integrity. So the, the area is widely covered. JSTOR, for example, is a database which has a wealth of research, which has conducted, has been done on the whole issue of plagiarism. And they have gone so far as to look at the fact that yes, it is a problem which plagues academic institution, but what is the role and responsibility of publishers? And so I would encourage you to look at that from um, JSTOR. And so we know that as the technology evolves, and as the challenge becomes more difficult, what you will find is that there are tools used by both academic institutions and publishers to check your work to see whether or not you have plagiarized. So the UE4 example uses Turnitin and Turnitin is used worldwide by academic institutions, publishers will use a software called Authenticate. And what that does is to check your work to see th that you have not plagiarized, you have not taken someone else's work and you are, are attempting to pass it on as your own. Now in the same breath, we also have what we call citation management tools and what these tools allow you to do is to manage your bibliographic information much more efficiently. It can be frustrating. It can be time consuming when you are doing research to ensure that you have properly captured and organized all of your bibliographic information in a single space. Now, some of the key features that you will find is citations for journal articles, books, and other sources. And when you look at EndNote, it integrates well with Ulink. It also integrates well with Google Scholar. It integrates with other bibliographic databases and other web pages. It affords you the opportunity to enter the citation manually or simply connect to an external um, database and to pull the information in. And once it is there, you can edit it. It presents you with all the different citation styles that you can use. So you can decide at any given time which one you are going to be using. Your citations can be organized and managed using, using folders and they can be shared with others. And so if you're doing a joint research, you're doing a group paper, group work, you are able to share these um, citations. It allows you to generate your bibliography, um, your end notes if they're needed, footnotes, or your in-text citation. And you are able to export your citation from one management tool to the other. Some persons like to work on EndNote desktop. It integrates well with EndNote online. Now there are other tools available. So we know, for example, there's Reference Manager, there is Zotero, but through the university, you are able to access EndNote. It is provided as one of the products of a database, Web of Science, for which the libraries across the four campuses have a subscription. And so we're encouraging you to make use of it. It is online. Once you have gone into um, Web of Science and um, created your account using your UA email address, 
You can go anywhere in the world, just Google EndNote online, sign in, and you're good to go. So, as I said before, it is available through EndNote. It is compatible with both Windows and Mac. And I now see where if you have an iPad or an iPhone, EndNote has plugins. And there is a wonderful feature, which is Sight While You Write. And Mrs. Nelson will demonstrate that to you. So I think that ends my segment of the presentation. There is a um, EndNote, the parent company Clarivate has a wealth of information on how to use the different features of EndNote, their videos, etc., available. And of course, the library is here and we stand as always ready to help you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Mrs. Nelson at this point in time will take over and she will be doing a demonstration of EndNote. Mrs. Nelson. Thank you very much for yes, that. Yes, I'm here. Ms. Sadler, um, just before Ms. Nelson come, just come, just want to acknowledge um, the breadth of your presentation. I think that many of us who are here today, we are aware that plagiarism is important, but I was particularly taken by your highlighting of the consequences, um, you know, losing your job and, and, and so on. Some of us might think that um, play, avoiding plagiarism is something nice to do, but I think from listening to the breadth of your presentation, um, we get a sense that it's more, it is required and absolutely an ethical standard, ethical and professional standard to which we all should aspire. So thank you so much. Um, and as you mentioned, our next speaker is going to be Mrs. Nelson. And so I just want to tell our attendees a little bit about Mrs. Nelson, a librarian, also with the Yui Mona Libraries cataloging section. And she graduated from the University of the West Indies with a Bachelor of Science in Management Studies and Accounting and a Master of Library and Information Science. Mrs. Nelson, it also holds a business administration diploma from the University of Technology, Jamaica, and her responsibilities include creating metadata, teaching information literacy, and providing referencing services. So Mrs. Nelson, welcome, and please go ahead and present to us on EndNote 20. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be doing a demonstration of EndNote 20. Sharing, I'll be sharing my screen. All right, so to get to EndNote, you can start at the, lib at the university's homepage by clicking on libraries. And here you are at the library's homepage. Then you click on your link. And from here, you can begin your search. So you insert your keywords. I'll be doing, my keywords are green banking. And I search. So now that I have my results, I can add a single record or a number of records to my EndNote library. So what I will do to add a single record, I click on the quotation marks, scroll down to the bottom, click on EndNote, And it takes me to the screen, which asks me to sign in, or if I'm not yet a member, I am required to register. So I register with my email address, preferably your UE address and a password of your choice, then you sign in. So I've already registered, so I can sign in.
So here is it, it's saying that I've imported one record. So if I click on my references, I'll see the one reference that I have imported, but I could import several records as I indicated. So I can go back to your willing, close this, and I select several records. Then I click on the three dots at the top of my screen. Are you seeing my screen? Then EndNote. Yes, 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 we are seeing it. And here is it, it is telling me that I've imported six records. So if I click on my references, all the references that I've imported from Gulink are there. But it is important that you pay attention to the title because um, depending on the style that you are using, then you may need to adjust your title. For example, this one should be in sentence case, so you will have to go in and edit it. So you click on it. And you will have to fix the title the sentence case. So essentially, you need to know your citation style because although um, it will place it in Ulink um, in EndNote for you, it will place it in there just like how it is um, it is in Ulink. So you have to know your citation style so you can edit each record if it is if it doesn't come out the way it should come out. All right, so we can save it. We can also enter records manually in our library. So we go to collect. And we click on new reference. And it gives us a, a database sheet for us to fill out the different fields. We would need to select the type of resource that we are referencing. So here I want to create a record for a book. So I click on book. And the book that I want to create a manual reference for is Progress Report on the Sustainable Development Goals 2019-2020, published by the Planning Institute of Jamaica. My author is Planning Institute of Jamaica. And the title is Sustainable Development Goals. The year of publication is 2022. And I could put in the place publish. Well, it depends on the style that I'm using. So I'm going to put in the place publish as Kingston, Jamaica, but I 
if I'm using APA, I will not need the place publish. Because APA no longer uses um, place of publication. I can also put in the publisher for this particular item as well as I could leave it out because APA again says, if your author and publisher is the same, you need not include a publisher. So I'm not going to include a publisher here. I'm just gonna save. So I go now to all references. And let's check. The one that I entered manually is in my EndNote library. I can also export records from the databases to my EndNote library. So let's go back to your winning. And go to databases. And the database that I want to export from is academic search complete. So I click on the letter A and here it is. It's telling me that I have no access because I am using it from off campus. So I need to sign in with my username and password. I'm just waiting for it to load. It's taking a little while. Let me go back. Let me do it again. I think maybe my internet is a bit slow. Okay, well that loads, I will demonstrate Oh, you can use the site as your write feature. So I'll just minimize this. So I'll go back to my EndNote library. So this is my EndNote library. So I can use the site as you write feature where I can insert citations from my library into my Word document. But for you to do that, you will have to download the site as you write plugin and you go to downloads. 
and you follow the instructions and you can download for Windows or from Macintosh, whichever device you have or whichever system you are using. I've already downloaded the plugin, so I can go ahead and insert references in my Word document. In the interest of time, I have created a Word document. So this is my Word document. And when you download the plugin, you should see a note added to your Word toolbar here. So I go to EndNote. And then I click on Insert Citation. And I can search by author's name or the keywords that I would have used when I initially created the EndNote library. So I'm going to search by green banking. Green banking. All right, so these are the records that it found in my EndNote library on green banking. So I go to my Word document and I want to insert this one into my Word document. So I click on insert citation. Just waiting, my computer is doing something. Let me just cl close this, all right. So I can, if I want a citation here, I put my cursor here and I go to insert citation. And suppose I want Chen, I click on Chen and then click on insert. So Chen is inserted right there. And if I scroll down to the bottom of my document, it not only includes my in-text citation, but it starts to compile my reference list. And it's based on the APA 7 citation style. So whichever style you are using, you have to select it, select it in your Word document. So I could also add another right here. So I go to insert citation. And suppose I want to insert park there. I click on park, insert. And here it is inserted. And if I scroll down, it is added to my reference list in the correct order. And if I had started a narrative with a citation, then I could edit this notation right here. So if I'd started the narrative with park, and Kim, noted that banks are exposed to a variety of climate related risk, then I could, I could also insert a reference here. So I could, so I put my cursor here 
And since I have, it depends on how you write. So since I have the narrative here, since I have the, I included the authors in the narrative, I can insert my citation right there. So I click on insert, insert. All right, and since the names are already in a narrative, I do not need the names in the notation. So I can edit this citation. So I go to edit citation and for this one and I edit the reference. So I exclude the author. So only the air is remaining right there because I already have the names in the narrative. And I could delete this one because I no longer need this one because I already have it in the narrative. So I edit again. Is the one that I need. So I remove citation and click on OK. So it is removed. No, that's how the cite as a write feature works. Let me go back now to the um to the databases to show you how to export from the databases to your EndNote library. Okay, so here we have our database, EBSCO, which is a multidisciplinary database. So if I put banking and climate change here, banking and climate change. And I do a search. Um, Say I'm interested in adding this one to my library as well as this one. I click on the plus sign to my right to add it to my folder. So I click on plus here. And I can add as many as I wish to my library. So. So I select those to add to my folder. Then if I go to the top of my screen, I click on folder and it says I have items and I can export the items that are in my folder to my EndNote library. So I click on export. And by default, it's on the format that I want. So I just click on save. It drops a file on my toolbar and I click on it and the items are directly exported into my EndNote library. So it is alerting me that seven references were exported to my EndNote library. I click on OK. So if I go to EndNote,
and I click on all references. See, it has now eight. I had eight references before, and now I have 15. I'm going to demonstrate how to export from another database, which is ProQuest, another multidisciplinary database. So let me go back to your link. So ProQuest is a database I want. So I click on P, ProQuest all subscribe content. Again, I search using my search terms, climate change and banking. And I search. So I can add individual items to my EndNote library by clicking on the quotation mark, or I can add a number of items to my library by checking each box beside each record. Then I come to the top of my screen, click on these three dots, And it gives me the option to export to EndNote as well as other citation management tools. So I click on EndNote here. Continue. Let me go again. So I click on EndNote. All right, so I check that I'm not a robot. Click on Continue. Again, it drops a file onto my toolbar. And if I click on it, all the items are in my EndNote library. So four, previously I've, I had 15. So if I go to EndNote, click on all my references. Now I have 19 references. I can create folders in my library. And to create folders in my library, I come to the top of my screen and I click on new group. I check the items that I want to add to the group first. Then I click on the on new group and it asks me to name my group. I can name this green banking. So it has created a group for me here with the five items that I've added. Should be green banking. So that's how you create your groups. You can um, create a bibliography directly from your EndNote library. So you can check the items that you want to be in your bibliography. Then you go to format, select bibliography, And you can use all the items in your library or you can use a subfolder. 
So I want to create references for um, a bibliography for those items in my green banking folder. And I select the style that I want. I want APA 7. File formats, I want rich text. So I can save it, I can email it, I can print and preview. So I'm gonna click on print and pre preview. All right, so those are the items that I would have added. And here it has created a reference list for me based on the AP citation style. And that in a nutshell is how you use EndNote. And EndNote makes it much easier for you to organize your references and to ensure that everything you cite in text are also included in your reference list. So this ends my presentation on EndNote. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I, 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 one of the things that I am struck by, it does take a while. This software can be so um, useful. It takes a while to set it up, but once you do, then anything, from any time you need to use these references, they're already there formatted in the way that you use them and so on. So, and of course, there's nothing more valuable than seeing the thing done. So we, hopefully we've been taking notes and that we can go and practice, practice, practice so that when we're writing on the pressure, um, we have one less thing to do. Uh, we can just pull our, references from EndNote. And also I find that in my writing, I, uh, I have sources that I cite repeatedly. So it's so valuable to already have it in my library. Yes. Okay, <laughs> right. So thanks a lot, Ms. Nelson. Yeah, so so um, colleagues, we're going to open up for questions and we have a first question for Ms. Sandler um, from Davia Pedler. And she wants to know if the library assists with reviewing Turnitin issues for graduate theses. So uh, okay. Connie, do you can put your questions in the Q&A or let me know and I'll acknowledge you and you can open your mic. Okay, go ahead, Mrs. Sutton. Okay, so to answer that question, to begin with, the library works very closely with our graduate students in what we call a consultation phase, a thesis consultation where as the students write, they can refer to us to um, review their thesis to ensure two things. One, they're meeting the um, UA thesis guideline and also the respective citation styles. So we will look at their in-text citation as well as their references to ensure that they're meeting the styles. Now, in terms of the Turnitin report, um, students are required to submit the similar to, similar to report with their thesis when they are submitting. It is a faculty who will decide what the threshold is. So the library does not come into play where that is concerned. However, if it is that the faculty says to the student, there are challenges with your um, Turnitin report, and you need to have these addressed. Sometimes the students may come to us and we will sit with them and go through to see where did you go wrong with your in-text citation? Where did you go wrong with your references? Because oftentimes you may have an in-text citation, but that is not in the reference, or it could be vice versa. Some students too may have what we call over-quotation. They suffer from over-quotation. And when you have that, it is going to be a challenge. So while um, administering Turnitin is an is a, is a academic matter, if students reach out to us and say, I have an issue, my faculty has indicated that I need to um, address these factors, 
we will sit with you, go through the report, look to see what it says, and how is it that we can help you to make the necessary adjustments. It could be the way you presented the citation. Are your page numbers missing from your, your, your quotations? And those are the areas that we will, we will help you. And I can say that we work very closely with our grad students. We have the Mona Information Literacy Unit and we have our liaison librarians. So all of us are on board where grad students are concerned. Okay, thank you. Um, CDL would like to a little bit of a repeat about how to access and all right so i'm going to share my screen just to show you so i'm going to go to the library um are you still seeing my screen i think i'm no okay. one Okay, so I'm stop sharing first. Thanks. Oh, sorry. All right, so I'm going to share screen and I'm going to go back to the library. So I'm going to go into resources, electronic databases, and there is a database called Web of Science. And I'm selecting it. Now, um, under normal circumstances, it would ask me to sign in. Um, am I on the network? So if I'm on the network, I would be good to go. And at the top of that, um, you would see the different products and EndNote is one of them. I, I have a feeling that I'm not on the network and I may have forgotten my, I may have forgotten my username and password. But when you go in at the top corner over here, so it would pop up to say, um, I could share. All right. All right, you want, I'm plugging back off the network. All right, Mrs. Nelson, go ahead. So what it would do, it would pop up to say that, um, so it would, once, I'm, once I've signed in, I would see it as a product at the top. So while Mrs. Nelson brings up her screen, now once I, I have got put in my ULIN credentials in Web of Science, I sign into EndNote at the top, and I create an account using my UA email. And once I've done that, I would encourage you just to download a plugin to cite while you write. And anywhere in the world you go, you can use um, you can use EndNote. And because it is the subscription is paid for through the library, you would not have to worry. Because if you were to do it on your own, it may come at a cost. Okay, that's very good. Um, I think, oh, so Mrs. Nelson yes. is still right. showing. So you. she's going to click on yeah. products, click on products, Mrs. Nelson. Right, click on products. And there it is. End note. Um, scroll down, click, click back on products and scroll down to end note reference manager, right. And you just register. She's already in, so it would not, rec it, it already recognizes her. So the, it just comes up to register and you put in your e email address, any password, and then you can use it wherever you go. You would just need to um, have the plugin and we can actually send you the instructions on how to download the plugin and how to set it up. It is fairly easy. Um, just one thing to highlight that EndNote also allows you to download PDF documents. So you can literally pull your PDF documents into EndNote and you can highlight them, manipulate them through EndNote as well.
Okay, so CD, I hope that works for you. And I think all of us will be appreciating that you asked that question so that we can be a little more um, clear about how to actually access the software. Um, so we have another question from Ricardo. He, he said he wants to know if there are any other um, similarity checking software that you'd recommend or online sources in addition to Turnitin. Um. <laughs> well, Turnitin um, is used by academic institutions globally and the university uses Turnitin. So stick with Turnitin. I mean, there are others. There are others, but um, some of, and what you will find, unless you're going to pay for them, you're not going to get the best out of them. Because if you go online, you're going to see some that says they're free, but they're free only with so many words. And so they actually don't allow you to run your entire paper through. So I would say use Turnitin, it is globally accepted. And then also we might inadvertently run into predatory sites that offer to do that checking, but then they steal your paper. Yes. <laughs> I'm and, sure that's out there. Right. And from time to time, the library also does presentations on predatory journals. And um, we're looking at it not only from you mm -hmm. publishing in predatory journals, but also the fact that you may be using predatory sources as your source, your building block. And you know that um, in the social sciences, you may be looking at a lot of figures, et cetera. And so you have to be careful that your source has been um, reviewed, has been vetted. It, 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 it has the, the rigor. And um, when you talk about reliability and validity, that the information is credible. So that is another area that we also look at from time to time as we build an awareness among our graduate students and among our faculty, because we know the pressure to publish. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I see your hand, Ricardo, but before you open your mic, Davia has written an interesting question. I've been thinking about it. She wants to know, Davia wants to know, what if we realize there may be issues can we preempt an in-depth consultation without guidance by the faculty? Um, yes, students come to the library on their own um, to ask us for assistance. So in addition to the Mona Information Literacy Unit, there is also a, what, what we call a MAPS librarian. And that librarian deals with postgraduate um matters and so um you can go through to the maps librarian you can go to milu and if you know who your liaison librarian is you can go specifically to that liaison librarian so for example in addition to being the faculty board rep i'm also the liaison librarian for econ and i'm the liaison librarian for um the hotel and tourism management students. In the past, I worked with Mona School of Business. And some of those students will tell you that Maxine Letman, I will see a student who comes to the library and ask for Miss Sadler. And I say, you're asking for Miss Sadler? And they will say, yes, Miss Letman has sent them across. <laughs> and so I will sit with them. Mrs. Nelson works directly with the education students. And so they will go to her. And that is something that we are open to because when your thesis is submitted to graduate studies, graduate studies sends a formal letter to the campus librarian requesting that the library um, does a scrutiny. At that point in time, it is called a scrutiny. And a scrutiny is done of the layouts to ensure that all the university guidelines are met as well as its citation styles. And so a librarian has to do a formal review. At that point, a letter is sent on the signature of the campus librarian to the Office of Graduate Studies to say that the thesis certificate can be released. So, so we have a vested interest 
to ensure that as much as is possible, the student gets it right before it gets to final submission. Otherwise, there is going to be a lot of legwork to um, fine tune it because until we have signed off on it to say citation style has been adhered to, UWI thesis guide is adhered, is adhered to, um, graduate studies will not release the certificate. That's very interesting because sometimes on the students' side, they can't understand what happens on the back end after they've submitted in addition to grading. So knowing that you know the library is involved and other reassurances need to be made before the actual um, grade is awarded, that's valuable information for us. Right, and just to highlight that, when you look at the citation, these are in international standards. So mm -hmm. they're used by Harvard, they're used by Oxford, wherever you go. So we have to make sure that when a researcher from anywhere in the world picks up a UWI thesis, just by looking at it, you can tell at a glance that this is a citation style that was used. Okay. Um, Ricardo had his hand up for a while, but he might have um change. No, still, oh sorry. okay okay go ahead ricardo okay so hello mrs sadler just wanted to ask a quick follow-up question based on your response so i just wanted to clarify can can we as students use turnitin um independent of our lecturers so i know in undergrad we were able to submit our papers after mm -hmm. after like a class id or enrollment key, something like that was created. And we submitted our papers to it through that. But are we able to utilize the services of Turnitin um, independent of our lecturers to check our papers before submission? Okay, graduate studies, um, I know usually issues are key um, that they provide students with so that they can check their um thesis so where the library is not fully able to answer that question because in truth and in fact we don't really interact with turn it in so what you could do is to check um with graduate studies but if you are if you're submitting your paper on the learning management platform i know that most lecturers have actually embedded turn it in through um the platform but have a discussion, I would say, with your lecturer, and you could also have a discussion with grad studies. I wonder also if um, if they just want to check it, if they could just go to turnitin.com and attempt to um, to well, independently upload. Because, I don't because, know. You, because you have to pay for it. So because um, Turnitin is, a, is, is one of those... Um, software that you have to pay for so mm. i know that to use it you would need to have some some sort of key in order to access it okay. but you can as i say how i i know because sometimes students will email us asking us how to get on um, the postgrad students and we usually direct them to graduate studies and they provide them with um the the the, the enrollment key etc especially when they want to have their thesis um run through it okay all right um have we covered all the questions that were in the chat or does anyone else have a question that they'd like to ask i don't see any other questions in the chat and i don't see any hands going up so it seems as if we have satisfied um all our attendees in terms of the information that they need. Uh, we're really grateful to Ms. Sadler and Mrs. Nelson. Um, and thank you to all the participants who have attended. Um, our organizers are Dr. Delroy, Delroy Shevers, Associate Dean for Graduate Studies and Research in the Faculty of Social Sciences and Mrs. Shara Williams-Lou, who serves as a research and planning officer 
in the social sciences faculty office. And of course, I'm not gonna miss this opportunity to acknowledge that Mrs. Mrs. Williams Lou is a graduate of the Applied Psychology Program. So um, I just wanted, had to say that just in case um, persons like Ricardo and other students in the Applied Psych Program need to recognize the members of their network, please forgive me. So of course, um, there is going to be a part two of the graduate studies um, graduate students refresher series, uh, courtesy of the Faculty of Social Sciences, and that's scheduled already for March 16, 2023. So please save the date, um, 2023, probably your first most important event on March 16, and that's going to focus on publishing your thesis, publishing your thesis. So go ahead and get the work done so that you will actually be ready for part two when it comes um, in this very important series. Again, thanks to everyone. And I wish you a very pleasant rest of the afternoon on this November 17th day. And of course, a successful end to this semester. All the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Too. And thank you for having us. Indeed, thank it's you. our pleasure. <laughs> thanks again.